Okay, everyone, welcome to part three of the video lecture for chapter eight on metabolism. Um, so at the end of the last uh, video lecture for this chapter, we had just wrapped up talking about the ATP cycle, which again, you see here in this slide. Um, and really for the rest of this chapter, what we're gonna be talking about is enzymes uh, and the way that enzymes make it possible for cells to run their cell chemistry very, very rapidly, which is key to having a living thing. Uh, so it's very important for, for life, obviously. Uh, it's been said that um, life wouldn't be possible without enzymes, at least life as we know it anyway. Um, so enzymes are called catalysts. They are biochemical catalysts. This is a chemical agent, protein typically, that speeds up a reaction without being consumed by the reaction. Um, so enzymes are called catalytic proteins. A great example <clears throat> excuse me, of how enzymes work is the hydrolysis of sucrose. So remember in an earlier chapter, we talked about hydrolysis reactions. These are reactions that use a water molecule to break a bond between two monomers, for example. So let's take a look at this. Um, here you see an example of an enzyme in action. So what you're seeing here is a sucrose molecule. Again, sucrose is table sugar made up of two smaller monosaccharides, glucose and fructose. Um, if you had a water molecule in, in the presence of an enzyme, in this case sucrase, we can break that glycosidic linkage and separate those two monomers from each other. Okay. Now an important point about enzymes is that they're typically named for what they work on. So sucrase is an enzyme that breaks down sucrose. One more important point about the name of an enzyme, if you ever see an ending of ASE on a molecule, or for the name of a molecule, you automatically know that that molecule is an enzyme. So sucrase is an enzyme, you know that because of the ASE ending, and you also know that sucrase works on sucrose. So enzymes are very specific. Sucrase only operates on sucrose, nothing else. All right, so enzymes are typically made for the one molecule they work on, and you know that they are an enzyme because of the ASE ending. Now, there are some enzymes that don't, whose names don't end in ASE. There are some exceptions, but if you ever see an ASE ending, that always tells you 100% that you're talking about an enzyme, okay? All right, so how do enzymes actually work? Well, <clears throat> enzymes make it easier for a reaction to go forward. There's something referred to as energy of activation. Okay, energy of activation or activation energy. That is E sub A, and you see that right here. Okay, so sort of up to this point in this chapter, when we've been talking about catabolic and anabolic reactions and exergonic and endergonic reactions, I've kind of maybe given you the impression that. When you have a reaction, a catabolic reaction where something is being broken down um, and that therefore is exergonic, I've sort of given you the impression that no energy is needed to start that reaction because it's spontaneous, right? It's spontaneous overall in the sense that it does liberate energy. You end up with products that have less energy than the reactants you started with. But we still need to sort of kickstart kick start that reaction. And the energy that we have to invest rather into that reaction to kickstart it and make it go forward, that is our energy of activation, E sub A. So think of it this way, go back to the house analogy. You could stand there at the curb and watch a house slowly break down over 75 years, right? So you know it's exergonic, catabolic, and a spontaneous process. Um, or <clears throat> if you want to see it give off all of its energy very, very rapidly, maybe in about an hour, you could kickstart it. How? Put a flame to it. Put a lit match to it somewhere and cause it to go up in flames. You have accelerated that process by providing energy of activation in the form of the flame, the, the lit match. Okay, so if we want our chemistry to run very fast, like the house burning down rapidly, we need to be able to supply this energy of activation or at least reduce the amount of energy of activation that's needed so that it's easier to make that reaction go forward. So let's take a look at this, at this figure here. We have our reactants, A, B, and C, D, whatever they might be. 
and the goal is going to be to convert them to our products AC and BD. So we have a negative delta G that tells you that overall this process is spontaneous. It means that our reactants have more energy and our products less energy. So that should go forward on its own over time. But we have this energy here, energy of activation, that we need to put in to convert those reactants to what's called the transition state, where the bonds become stressed. So think of it this way. Think of taking a twig, right? A twig that you find in your yard off of a tree, and you want to break it. You can't just, in your mind, will it to break. You've got to apply some energy, right? You've got to put both hands on either end of that twig and bend it. When you do that, you're supplying activation energy until eventually what happens? The twig snaps. In other words, you've added enough energy to make that twig go into a transition state where it ultimately snaps. So right here, the transition state is where you have put enough energy into the twig right up to the point where it snaps. When it snaps, that's the reaction going forward, okay? So we have to put in that amount of energy, energy of activation. Well, <clears throat> typically in our bodies, in our cells, the energy of activation is supplied in the form of the thermal energy, the heat uh, that's, that's found in the surroundings of the cell, the body heat. But that energy is, only, is enough only because enzymes have lowered that energy of activation barrier. They've converted it from a mountain, let's say, to a molehill, right? Squashed it down so it's easier to get over with the enzyme present. And this is essentially how <clears throat> how uh, enzymes work. All right, so the bottom line there is that enzymes catalyze reactions by lowering that energy of activation barrier. An important point about this, though, is that enzymes do not change or alter the delta G. They don't change the amount of energy we can get out of the reaction. So remember, delta G is the difference in the amount of energy in our reactants versus our products, in this case here. It's negative. In this case, that tells you this reaction is catabolic, exergonic, and spontaneous. By lowering the energy of activation barrier, we're not affecting that delta G at all. So enzymes don't affect that, all right? Instead, they're speeding up a reaction that would occur eventually on its own because it is spontaneous, but they're speeding it up by lowering the amount of energy that has to be put in to make the reaction go. So instead of taking a flame flower, flower to, flame thrower rather to the house to make it burn down, we just put a match to it with the enzyme present and it happens more easily with less energy needed. All right, <clears throat> so let's play this animation. If exergonic reactions occur spontaneously, reactions occur what spontaneously. keeps molecules from breaking apart and cell chemistry from racing out of control? For any reaction to occur, even a downhill reaction, some energy must be added to get the reaction going. This energy is needed to break bonds in the reactant molecules. The energy needed to start a chemical reaction is called the energy of activation, E sub A. This required energy input represents a barrier that prevents even energy releasing exergonic reactions from occurring without some added energy. How does a living cell overcome the energy barrier so that its metabolic reactions can occur quickly and precisely. A special kind of protein called an enzyme is the answer. An enzyme serves as a biological catalyst, increasing the rate of a reaction without being changed into a different molecule. An enzyme does not add energy to a reaction. Instead, it speeds up a reaction by lowering the energy barrier. An enzyme is very selective. Its three-dimensional shape allows it to act only on specific molecules referred to as the enzyme substrates. As the substrates bind to the enzyme's active site, they are held in a position that facilitates the reaction. This takes less activation energy than the unaided reaction. Products form and are released. The enzyme emerges unchanged from the reaction. Okay, so there you have it. That's essentially how enzymes work. Now we're going to talk about the ways a little bit later on in which an enzyme can lower that energy of activation barrier. Um, but for now, just suffice it to say that they do. Okay, it make, makes the reaction happen more 
more easily and more quickly. Um, all right, so let's look at this at this figure here, which will further explain this. So let's imagine that we have a reaction. We have some reactants, again, shown here on the left, that need to be converted to products shown here on the right. And we know our delta G is negative because our reactants have higher energy and our products lower energy. So this is the energy, let's say, that a cell maybe is trying to extract from the food molecule. So it can power its operations, right? That's why we eat food, right, to get energy. Um, so the black line here shows the course of the reaction without an enzyme present. Remember, <clears throat> if, if the goal here for this reaction is to get out a certain amount of energy, to extract a certain amount of energy from a food molecule, like a fat or a protein or a sugar molecule, then you probably want to have this uh, chemical reaction be as efficient as possible. All right. Well, without an enzyme, the black line here represents our, the course of our reaction. And you can see that we need to put in that amount of energy. This is our energy of activation here. That's quite a lot of energy to have to put in to kickstart this reaction. It might be that without the enzyme present, you're putting in as much energy to make the reaction go as you're getting out. Well, what's the point? I mean, would you invest money if you knew you weren't going to make anything? Would you invest energy if you knew you were putting in as much energy as you were going to get out? No, there'd be no point. You could stuff food in your in your face 27 uh, 24 7 and still actually starve to death because the processes that your cells use to break down that food would require as much energy as you get from the food. So what would be the point? Well, with the enzyme present, you see we can reduce that energy of activation barrier. Now you only need to put in that amount of energy and so now you can see the payoff is much greater. So you could say the enzymes make life worth living. They make our metabolic processes more efficient by requiring less energy of activation so that energy that we get out is more of a profit or the energy we get out is more of a profit in that sense. It's a very important point about enzymes. Okay, so how do uh, enzymes work? Well, first of all, let's define some, some terminology here, okay? So we have a term called substrate. The substrate is whatever molecule the enzyme is operating on. So a few slides back, I showed you how sucrase breaks down sucrose, sucrase being the enzyme. In that example, sucrose was the substrate. It is the molecule that the enzyme, sucrase in that example, was operating on. Okay, So substrate is whatever molecule a particular enzyme operates on. And typically what happens is that on the enzyme itself, on the protein, the catalytic protein, there, sorry guys, there's a location called the active site. The active site typically is a depression or a pit, an opening or a trench, let's say a trough in the surface of the protein where the substrate molecule fits. So the key point here is that the enzyme and the substrate fit together. Think of them as fitting together like a key into a lock or a hand into a glove. This is why one enzyme typically only works on one other kind of molecule because those two molecules have shapes that conform to one another. They fit together like puzzle pieces. Okay, uh, you can think of the, you know, the key to your house, for example. That key should only work that, the front door of your house, all right? It's not gonna work the front door of your neighbor's house, presumably. So that's what we call specificity, and enzymes are specific to the substrates that they operate on. So when the substrate fits into the active side of the enzyme, we have something what, that's called an enzyme substrate complex. This is when the two are actually joined together. Okay, And that's when the reaction occurs. That's when the enzyme causes the reaction in the substrate to take place. Okay, <clears throat> so when the active site accommodates or takes in that substrate, then we have something called induced fit occurring. Okay, Now, induced fit, um, for lack of a better way of putting it, is when the enzyme sort of embraces or snuggles down around the substrate molecule. In many cases, the active site will close off behind the substrate and sort of isolate it from the external environment. And that's when the chemical reaction for that substrate can occur. So let's take a look at a figure here. So here we have a large enzyme molecule. Okay, you can see this is a, a space filling mo model, so you see all the individual atoms in it. 
Here's the active site. It's a three-dimensional uh, location on the surface contour of that, of that enzyme. Here's our substrate. The substrate has a shape that allows it to fit into the active site, as you see here. And when it does that, you see now how the active site has sort of closed around behind it, isolating that substrate from the external environment. That's the enzyme substrate complex. This isolation of that substrate from the external environment, that's the induced fit, okay? So at that point, that substrate molecule, whatever it might be, is gonna be converted into some sort of product through a chemical reaction. Okay, <clears throat> so let's talk about how it is then that the enzyme, when it snuggles down around that substrate and induced fit, let's talk about how it is then the enzyme um, fosters or makes that chemical reaction happen more quickly. In other words, how does it lower the energy of activation barrier? Well, really there are three different ways this happens. First of all, the active site can orient substrates correctly. So in some cases, many cases actually, the active site of an enzyme will fit two different substrate molecules, okay? They'll fit into that active site, but they only fit in one way. They only fit in in a way that lines up the functional groups on those two substrates. Remember we said that functional groups are like the business ends of molecules. If two molecules bump into each other and there's, their functional groups are lined up, a reaction may occur. If their functional groups are not lined up, a reaction is not likely to occur. So you can have an active side of an enzyme that will, that will incorporate or allow both of those substrates to fit in, but only in such a way that their, their functional groups line up. That means it takes less energy for that reaction between those substrates to occur because their functional groups are already lined up forcibly by the active side of the enzyme. That's one way that the energy of activation barrier can be lowered. Another way is simply by straining substrate bonds. This is like, you know, the analogy of the twig. You put stress on the twig by bending it, it snaps. <clears throat> That's the reaction. Well, when that induced fit occurs, when that enzyme undergoes that subtle change of shape, that can put strain on those substrate bonds, just like you straining the twig as you bend it, and that can help that reaction to happen more easily with, with less energy needed, okay? To, to strain those bonds and break those bonds. And finally, the enzyme, or, or the active site rather, can provide uh, a favorable microenvironment. So what's a microenvironment? A microenvironment is a small volume of space that has different uh, environmental conditions than the surrounding larger volume of space. So here, for example, you have a substrate that goes into the active side of an enzyme. Maybe the active side is lined by amino acids that are acidic. Remember, we talked about amino acids that are acidic, some that are basic, and so on. <clears throat> If the amino acids lying that active site of that protein, that enzyme, are acidic, and the active site closes down around during the induced fit, down around the substrate, it can lower the pH inside the active site, and that can cause the reaction to happen more rapidly. Or maybe there are uh, amino acids lining the active site that are basic. They can raise the pH, <clears throat> make it more basic, which again would help that uh, reaction to occur more quickly. Um, so that's what we mean by providing a favorable microenvironment. But all of these are ways to reduce the energy of activation to make the reaction happen more easily, more quickly, with less energy necessary. All right, so let's look at an example here. This is basically how this works. So part number one, step number one, our substrates enter the active site. This is a case where there are two different substrates that need to react with each other. The active site that you see here will fit them both. They both go in, and now you see we have induced fit. The enzyme has changed shape a little bit, and that could be lining up those substrates so that their, their functional groups uh, come into contact with each other. All right, the reaction occurs. You see now we have, react, we have our reactants converted products. Products are released, and now the enzyme will go back to its normal shape where the active site is open, and we can have substrates come in again and the whole process continue in another cycle. 
And this can happen <clears throat> in you know, a thousandth of a second. It's extremely fast, the way that these enzymes work. But again, the enzymes are reusable, as you see here. Once they're done with one round of converting substrates to products, they can do it again and again and again very, very rapidly. All right. So important point, another important point about enzymes is, as I said, they're proteins and remember structure and function. These proteins, these enzymes have a very specific shape, which gives their active site the shape necessary for the substrates to fit into the active site. That means that the enzymes need to have the correct shape. But the thing is that there are environmental parameters, conditions in our bodies that can alter the shapes of enzymes, of proteins. Generally, there's things like temperature and pH. Those are really the two most important. Salt concentration can do this as well. Uh, but there are also other chemicals uh, that can alter enzyme function by altering the shape of the enzymes. But in terms of natural things in our body, usually it's temperature and pH. This is one of the primary reasons why our physiology is geared to maintain a fairly constant temperature and pH. Because if temperature goes too high or low, if pH goes too high or low, that can cause proteins that are behaving as enzymes to unfold. They can lose their shape. Uh, they can denature, which we talked about earlier uh, when we were talking about proteins. So as an example of this, each enzyme has an optimal temperature where it functions best. Uh, that's also true of pH. Each enzyme will have an optimal pH where it can function the best. So these optimal temperatures and pH are really what our physiology is largely about. It's about maintaining those constant conditions, the conditions that are most favorable to maintain the necessary shape of our enzymes that they need to work at their highest efficiency. So if we look at an example of this, here in the top figure, we see the optimal temperature for two enzymes, okay? These are two um, um, different enzymes. Here we have the optimal temperature for the typical human enzyme, and think about human body temperature. It's about 98.6 on average, plus or minus about one degree. That's around 37 degrees Celsius. So what you're seeing here is the rate of enzyme activity. The peak rate of activity, so the rate of reaction on the y-axis, the peak is right at about 37 degrees Celsius for the typical human enzyme. Notice what happens at high temperatures. It drops off very rapidly. This is why a high fever can be so dangerous, much above 105, 106, and your enzymes stop functioning because they unfold, they lose their shape. And if they don't have the right shape, they can't function. You can see that low temperatures do this too, but not as quickly as high temperatures do. What about heat tolerant bacteria? Uh, bacteria that live in, in um, hydrothermal pools and, and things like that that you might find out at Yellowstone National Park. They have temperatures of peak uh, reaction rates upwards of 77, 78 degrees Celsius. I mean, human enzymes, you can see, would, would cease to function long before ever reaching that temperature. They would unfold completely. In fact, the polypeptide would probably break down into individual amino acids at that high temperature. But species like some bacteria that are adapted to live in those high temperatures have enzymes that are adapted to maintain their shapes at such high temperatures. Their enzymes are completely inactive at normal human body temperature. <clears throat> so this is a great example of evolution optimizing things to work in the environments in which they're found. What about pH? So here we have two different human uh, or mammal enzymes. Here we have uh, pepsin. Pepsin is a stomach enzyme. You know that the, the stomach is a very acidic environment. So pepsin works best at around pH 2 the average pH you find is in stomach acid. Um, much above or below that, it unfolds, loses its function. Now, trypsin is an intestinal enzyme. The intestine is a fairly basic environment, average pH of around eight. And you see that's the pH where trypsin has its highest efficiency or its highest rate reaction. <clears throat> so this is important because this is talking about these two uh, very important environmental conditions, temperature and pH, that uh, determine enzyme function. Again, this is why we have to maintain these fairly constant conditions because we need our enzymes to be functional. Okay, now up to this point I've been talking about enzymes kind of working on their own, but typically they don't work on their own. We have um, other molecules typically 
called cofactors that very often help enzymes to do their jobs. These are non-protein enzyme helpers. Okay, they can be inorganic, like metal ions. So for example, calcium two plus, magnesium two plus, for example, lots of others. These are metal ions that very often attach to an enzyme and make it work more efficiently. Um, but and these cofactors can also be organic. If they're organic, they're referred to as coenzymes. So coenzymes are organic um, enzyme helpers, molecules that contain carbon and hydrogen are organic, right? Uh, you might know these better by this term, vitamins. Vitamins are organic cofactors. They are coenzymes that help our enzymes work more efficiently and work faster, okay? All right. <clears throat> Now let's talk about the way it is that our cells actually control our enzymes. Uh, one thing about enzymes is, is that they're kind of overeager. They, they, they work very efficiently and more often than not, they have to be kind of reined in and controlled or else they'll sort of drive cell chemistry out of control. Things kind of run amok, right? So we have molecules called inhibitors, okay? Inhibitors or inhibitory molecules. Um, these are molecules that rein enzymes in, slow them down when they need to be slowed down. We have really two types. We have what are called competitive inhibitors and non-competitive inhibitors, okay? And I'll explain more about these in a second, but for now, just suffice it to say that competitive inhibitors bind to the active site of an enzyme and therefore they compete with the substrate. Remember, the substrate normally binds to the active site of the enzyme but if a competitive inhibitor gets there first, that enzyme's active site is blocked. The substrate can't get in. All right, we also have non-competitive inhibitors. These are inhibitory molecules that don't bind to the active site of an enzyme. They bind to some other site elsewhere on the molecule, elsewhere on the enzyme, called a regulatory site. And when they bind, when the inhibitor binds to that regulatory site, it causes the active site of that same enzyme to change shape. It's like rekeying the lock. The substrate no longer fits, okay, as long as that inhibitory molecule is bound to that regulatory site. So examples of inhibitors include toxins, poisons, pesticides, antibiotics. This is how these things typically work. Antibiotics typically kill bacteria by shutting down a really important enzyme in a key metabolic pathway, meaning that that bacterium can't make some product or can't run some very important or crucial chemical reaction. And that typically ends up killing that bacterium. Pesticides, uh, other toxins work in essentially the same way. They shut down key enzymes important for biochemical reactions. So let's take a look at how this works. Here we have normal binding of a substrate molecule to an active site of an enzyme. You can see how their shapes allow them to fit together, okay? If that substrate binds, some reaction occurs converting that substrate to some product. In the case, however, of competitive inhibition, what we have is a competitive inhibitor molecule that has a shape that allows it to fit into the active site so that if it's there, substrate molecule can't fit, no reaction occurs. That enzyme is down to the count. It is shut down for as long as that competitive inhibitor is present. Now, this is called a competitive inhibitor because it's competing directly with the substrate for access to the active site. It competes with it. In the case of non-competitive inhibition, we have an inhibitor, I'm sorry, an active site here that fits our substrate again, but in this case, a non-competitive inhibitor is bound to a sort of third-party regulatory site, not the active site, but when it does that, notice how the shape of the active site has changed, right? Compare it to what it was originally. Now it's changed, and so now our substrate doesn't fit. That's like rekeying the lock, and again, that enzyme is shut down for as long as that non-competitive inhibitor is there. It's called a non-competitive because it's not competing with the substrate for access to the same site, for access to the active site. It binds somewhere else, so it's non-competitive. Okay, so this is really important because it, it's for certain that chemical chaos would, would ensue if a cell's metabolic pathways were not tightly regulated by inhibitory molecules shutting down enzymes, okay? Now, this is one way to do it. 
but a cell can also shut down, turn on, turn off the genes that are necessary for coding for the enzymes. A cell can actually shut down production of enzymes if it needs to, in addition to using either competitive or non-competitive inhibition to shut down the enzymes that are already there and actively working in the cell, okay? Um, all right, <clears throat> let's go back to the, though to talking about how it is that these inhibitory molecules actually shut down uh, enzymes directly. So we have a process called allosteric regulation. Allosteric regulation occurs when um, a inhibitory molecule binds to a protein at one site, an enzyme at one site, and that then affects the protein's function at the active site. So non-competitive inhibition is an example of allosteric regulation, okay? In allosteric, you have an inhibitory molecule, an inhibitor binding to a regulatory site on an, on an enzyme, and that then affects the active site. That's allosteric. Um, most of these enzymes that are regulated allosterically like this are usually made of multiple polypeptide subunits. So they have multiple globular proteins that make them up, multiple tertiary level proteins. So they are quaternary level proteins made up of multiple tertiary level globular proteins, okay? And these big enzymes, these allosterically regulated enzymes, oscillate or waffle back and forth between active and inactive forms very rapidly. And the binding of an activator will stabilize the enzyme in the active form. The binding of an inhibitor will stabilize it in the inactive form. So we've talked about inhibitors, but now I mentioned activators. We have activator molecules that will bind to these allosterically regulated enzymes that are oscillating back and forth between active and inactive forms. The activator will, will bind to it just at the right time when it's in the active form and lock it into the active form. And this is what you see here. So here we have allosteric activators and inhibitors. So here you see we have a large multi subunit polypeptide, that's a quaternary level protein, one, two, three, four uh, tertiary level proteins. Each one has an active site, one, two, three, and four, and there are one, two, three, four regulatory sites. Well, this enzyme is in the active form, but then in the next second, it, it waffles or oscillates rather into the inactive form where you can see that the active sites are closed up it then goes back to the active form. So it's doing this constantly. If an activator binds to one of these four activator sites at the right time, it can lock the enzyme in the active form, and then each of those four active sites can be again uh, taking in substrates and reacting with them, causing them to react to produce products. Well, what if our cells need to shut down the enzyme? An inhibitor can bind just when the enzyme has, has oscillated into the inactive form, and lock it in the active form so it's shut down completely. All right, another version of this is what's called cooperativity. Over here, we have activators and inhibitors that are different from the substrate, but in cooperativity, it's the substrate molecule itself that binds to an active site just when it opens up and locks the enzyme in the active form so other substrate molecules can bind. So in cooperativity, technically it's not allosteric, um, because it's the substrate binding the active site that causes this, but it's the substrate itself doing it. It's not some third party activator or inhibitor molecule, and that's why we call it cooperativity, okay? All right, so what are the signals then that tells your cells when to activate uh, your enzymes and when to inhibit your enzymes? Well, this is a process called feedback inhibition, okay? Feedback inhibition. This is when the cell actually uses information from the internal or extracellular environment to tell it when to activate its enzymes and when to inhibit its enzymes. Your cells want to have enough enzymes to, to produce enough products through biochemical reactions just to suit your needs. They don't want to make too much of something or make too little of something that's not efficient. Um, and your needs are different throughout the day. When you're sitting, 
or when you're sleeping at 2 a.m. in your bed, your needs for breaking down glucose are very low to produce energy. But at you know 1 p.m. when you're out during in your day being very active, maybe you're working out in the gym, you need to have a lot of glucose being broken down quickly because you need a lot of energy. So our levels of biochemical reactions are, are speeding up and slowing down throughout the day, and that's happening because our cells are activating and inhibiting enzymes uh, based on the needs of the cell. The process the cell uses to do this is called feedback inhibition, and it's important because it prevents the cell from wasting chemical resources by making more product than is needed or, or vice versa, making too little of something which could be dangerous uh, to the cell. So let's take a look at an example of how this might occur. So here we have a biochemical pathway, right? Multi-step pathway that is gonna convert some initial reactant called threonine right here into a final product isoleucine. There are a number of reasons why your cells need isoleucine, so don't worry about that. But there's an enzyme right here, okay, that's gonna do this. That enzyme is called threonine deaminase. You know it's an enzyme, ends in ASE, and it tells you it operates on threonine, which you see right here. Here's the active site. You see threonine bound to the active site. Uh, you also see a regulatory site there on threonine deaminase. So reaction one converts that into intermediate A. Intermediate A is then converted by a different enzyme into B, intermediate B, and so on down the line till we get our final product, isoleucine. But usually the enzymes that are responsible for controlling the rate of these biochemical pathways are early in the process. Threonine deaminase is the first enzyme in the process, okay? So let's say your cells need a lot of isoleucine. They're kind of low on it. Threonine binds with the enzyme, pathway occurs, and your cells start cranking out isoleucine, okay? But eventually your cells get enough isoleucine that it's kind of wasteful to make more, or at least to, to, to continue making it at the rate at which they were when you didn't have enough of it, right? You don't need as much now. Okay, so what's going to happen is that you now have a situation where there's excess isoleucine. The cell kind of overshoots, kind of makes a little bit more than it needs. There's excess around, and the isoleucine itself then binds to the regulatory site, right? The allosteric site on threonine deaminase. And when it does that, notice it changes the active site so it can no longer fit threonine. So your excess isoleucine starts to shut down all the, uh, many of the copies of threonine deaminase, so you can't make any more isoleucine. Your cells are making the isoleucine because they need it. So in addition to using some of the isoleucine to shut down the enzymes, your cells start using the rest of the isoleucine, converting it into other things. So think about what happens to the concentration of isoleucine then in the cells. It's going down. Eventually it gets so low because you've shut down the process that makes it that the isoleucine attached to the enzymes is all that's left. The cell plucks that off the enzyme and uses it because it needs it. And then what does that do to the enzyme? Converts it back into the active form, threonine binds, and production ramps up again. So it's the concentration of the isoleucine, whether or not it's present to bind to the enzymes, that ultimately causes this process to speed up and slow down to match your needs for isoleucine. And this happens without you even thinking about it. It's automatic. This is what feedback inhibition is. The cell is using feedback in the form of information about the concentration of isoleucine in the cell to determine whether or not to uh, inhibit or activate the enzymes that make isoleucine. Very often it's the product of the biochemical pathway itself that regulates the enzymes. All right, and that's what feedback inhibition is all about. Think about it, this is the way a thermostat in the room works, uh, right in your house. You set it to say 75 degrees in the summer, Temperature's higher than that, that's a signal for the thermostat to kick on and turn on the AC. Temperature drops below 75 a little bit, say 74. That's a signal that then tells the thermostat to switch off the AC unit. Turn off the AC, temperature starts to climb back up again uh, above the set point, maybe to 76. Another signal is sent to the AC unit by the thermostat telling it to kick on. And so you can see that the temperature would oscillate up and down throughout the day. The concentration of isoleucine or any biochemical product 
or product of a biochemical reaction would oscillate up and down throughout the day within very narrow limits. Those limits are fine. Those are the limits that we need to maintain it at. Okay. All right. So that is the end then of chapter eight. We got it done in three videos <clears throat> and we'll start with chapter nine.